Congress. And we are very delighted to have Rajat Gupta and other colleagues uh, on this uh, webinar. Uh, my role is just to welcome everyone and introduce uh, Mr. Aluwalia. Um, he's, the, he's really the one person uh, in some sense who one can really say doesn't need in, any introduction. Now I won't follow that up by introducing him. So um, also you can see here uh, other who's at Montek. The one introduction I can give is uh, Mr. Montek Alawalia is now a distinguished fellow at uh, CSEP, CSEP. And you also see uh, on your Zoom uh, screen, Mr. Anup Singh, uh, who is also a distinguished fellow uh, at CSEP. So Montek, that's my job is done. Uh, now it's all yours. Thanks very much, uh, Rakesh. Uh, thank you for asking me to moderate the seminar. I've looked forward to it. Uh, we have a very, very distinguished uh, presenter, main presenter, Rajat Gupta, who's, uh, who heads uh, McKinsey here uh, and has extensive knowledge. I, I won't go into all the details uh, which have already been circulated to you, but he's in a pretty central position uh, to present us the work that McKinsey has done. And McKinsey have been doing quite a lot of work in this area. So Rajat, with that uh, very brief introduction, uh, let me request you to take over the screen and to make your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rakesh Montek, for uh, the introduction. Really appreciate uh, your invitation from CSEP uh, for this discussion. Um, while the presentation comes up, uh, I think, Monica, you were going to put it up, so hopefully it'll come up. Um, uh, let me introduce uh, the topic, uh, the basis for the research that I will be presenting, uh, uh, and uh, some of the high-level messages that I would like you to take away uh, from today's, uh, for, for, at least from my presentation today. Uh, I will be talking about two things. Uh, first is the economic implication of the net zero transition globally and uh, in India. And second, uh, on the ideas and implications, uh, again, for industry, uh, but particularly for opportunities for Indian industry. The work, the first part of the work comes from a recent McKinsey Global Institute report, which is exactly this, the net zero transition, what will it cost, what it will bring. Uh, it's a piece of work that took us a year to do, a very substantial amount of investment uh, in uh, doing and uh, trying to understand uh, some of these implications. And I'll caveat these appropriately as we come to them. These are not predictions, most important caveat being most, these are not predictions, these are scenarios, and to be used as a tool for us to put the right sets of things in place uh, to ensure <coughs> this transition and a transition in a just manner. But the second part of what I will cover on ideas and implications uh, for industry um, is coming from our client work, my own client work in my leadership role uh, leading or co-leading sustainability for McKinsey globally, uh, we are seeing some of these trends and I'll talk about them. The two main messages that I would like to leave behind, one is well known, I think, that the transition itself is very significant. It is front-loaded. If we are to get to this net zero aspiration, 1.5 degree pathway by 2050, uh, it is front-loaded. It is uneven, uh, including uneven across sectors and uneven across countries. We know that but it's also rich with opportunities. And really the opportunity side is something that we don't talk about enough. From a corporate perspective for companies, the signals are already there and the companies have to position themselves to win the transition. And they have the opportunity to play defense, sorry, to play offense, in addition to playing defense, which is essential, but there is an opportunity here, an opportunity side of the equation, which we don't talk about perhaps enough. So maybe with that, uh, let me get into the content. My presentation itself, if you go to the next page, has two parts to it. I'll first talk about the um, uh, uh, report itself and then the implications for corporations. So uh, if you go to the next page, um, I think this everybody knows, right? So this is the one point degree pathway requirement, the dashed line, as far as uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions. In this case, this is demonstrated as energy related emissions in gigatons versus what is actually likely to happen. Uh, we, know, uh, that, uh, uh, we know that the COP uh, commitments from countries, companies variously add up to two, two and a half degrees. Different, different commentators have different, or analysts have different things to say about it. We are far short there as far as commitments are concerned. 
But if you look at McKinsey's reference case, which is basically what we expect to happen based on current policies and current signs of technology adoption that we are seeing or other elements of adoption that we are seeing, we are 90% away from a 1.5 degree pathway. So this equation doesn't close, neither does it close on the commitment front, nor does it close uh, on, on, uh, on the, what we see actu actualities on the ground. And some of the signs of that are visible in what's happened recently with the increasing coal use as opposed to decreasing coal use. By the way, the trend was decreasing in parts of the last decade. If you go to the next page, uh, um, so you know, we there are nine requirements in three buckets that we believe um, as McKinsey and McKinsey Global Institute, the physical building blocks, the economic adjustments and social adjustments and the enabling mechanisms. Um, I think the, if you put a temperature on each of these on how we are doing, the physical building blocks, the world is not doing that badly, right? We've made a fair, fair, fair amount of advancements. There's a piece of work, for example, we did in Europe on, which said that pretty much all of the net zero requirements of Europe's, Europe could be met with current technologies. Of course, huge amount of innovation required to adopt those uh, fully, but the technologies exist uh, and so on. Uh, so we're not doing that badly. Let's say we are in a 40, 50, or 100. On the next two, we're probably at 10 to 20. The economic and social, societal adjustments and the uh, enabling mechanisms. Some of what we saw, for example, at COP26 and hopefully with G20, both in Indonesia and Egypt, that we will see more of some of these. Uh, and some of what we are beginning to see from citizens and consumers, the point number nine uh, here. So today's discussion uh, or today's presentation is really around the economic and societal adjustments. It's about the capital reallocation, the demand shifts uh, and the compensating mechanisms because there will be winners and losers in this and the poorest, the poorest nations, the poorest people in the poorer nations or even the rich nations will be perhaps the ones that will face the inflation that's likely to come with this, the cost increases that are likely to come with this. And so mechanisms to make those adjustments I think, like I said, we are at a 10, 10, 10 to 20 or 100 on that. Um, I will talk about the economic shifts, uh, demand, capital allocation, costs, and jobs around this. And the six characteristics that you see in the light blue box is what I will use as the framing uh, to, to describe this. It's universal, it's significant, it's front-loaded, it's uneven, it's exposed to risk, and it's rich with opportunity. So let's go to the next page. I'll cover each of these as we go along. Universal, I think this page will not be a new news to anybody. If you take, um, if you take the uh, six or seven, seven uh, land use and energy use, energy generating and energy use sectors uh, of the world, power industry, mobility buildings, agriculture, forestry, and waste, all of them across the three different types of greenhouse gases have, a, have an important role to play. So this is universal. Uh, it is well known, all sectors have to contribute towards their net zero journey. Even agriculture, which is perhaps the most difficult sector and is actually not carbon dioxide is not the problem there. It's methane and it's nitrous oxides. If you go to the next page, um, now this is perhaps the, uh, if you just click to the, through to the full, uh, to show the full page in one go, that'll be helpful. Uh, at the, this is perhaps the most important finding. And by the way, different, different institutions that do this analysis have come up with somewhat similar numbers. Uh, I think the difference in these numbers here is because we've looked at all, not just the energy systems, but all of the systems, uh, physical systems and physical assets uh, that uh, I showed on the previous page. And we've, as much as is possible, taken an end-to-end -end view. What you see here is that we will need to spend 9.2 trillion. This is a gross number, not an incremental number. $9.2 trillion a year, so $9 trillion, let's say, a year for the next 30 years uh, to hit the net zero scenario. Uh, this spending is about $3.5 trillion more than the world is spending today. And the amount that's being spent today, which is about $5.7 trillion, the three previous blocks, the first three blocks here, that some of that, a, mil billion, a trillion dollars of that, will have to shift from low to high, uh, from high to low emission assets, right? So four and a half trillion dollars of either increased spending or reallocated spending. Now, this is relative to today. The baseline that I've described to you is the $5.7 trillion, the black portion of the bar here, relative to today. If you take this to compare this to future scenarios, which is the if you take the NGFS current policy scenario, mm -hmm. uh, the number is about 
trillion and dollars, right? So that scenario is 8.3 trillion dollars. Even relative to that, to get to net zero, we have to spend about a trillion dollars uh, more per year uh, in this 30 year time frame. If you go to the next page, uh, this is the India view of the same number. We have to spend $600 billion in these assets in total. It's two times, two times as much as what we are spending today in these sets of assets. Uh, the reallocation is not that large. It's the incremental spending that has to come into place uh, in a country uh, like India. Uh, if you go to the next page, uh, this actually gives you a lot more detail about India. So to, to 2020 spend the NGFS current policy scenario for India and the net zero scenario for India. I'm working with a net zero 2050 number again as a scenario, uh, uh, just to give us a sense of what it is. I do realize that India's commitment is now 2070, uh, but just to work off something. The number itself doesn't increase by that much, by about 15, 17% uh, relative to the current policy scenario. But the interesting thing is that even relative to the current policy scenario, if we were, if we are to hit close to net zero, if we are to leave ourselves a bit of the room, if we are to ensure that not too many assets go stranded, if we continue on the, on the path that we are, uh, the two interesting things here are the power block actually has to increase much more relative to the NGFS and certainly relative to today's law. The power is in green power um, that is much higher. And, uh, and, and maybe there was one more block. Actually, the other interesting thing is that the other couple of blocks which are um, um, buildings and agriculture remain pretty much the same. Okay, if we go to the next page then, um, the in, again, this is the point about it being front loaded. Uh, this is now the global perspective. In total, the $9.2 trillion that I described uh, is 7.5% of the world's GDP in this period, in this next 30 year period. The interesting thing is that it goes up as a percentage of the world's GDP and then it goes down. So these assets have to come into place now if we are to meet the top, if we are to meet the, um, uh, if we are meet, meet, meet the aspiration. If you go to the next page and I'll now talk about the uneven dimensions of this with particular focus on India, hold for yourself the 8% uh, odd number that I, 8% odd number that I talked about for the world, 7.5% number that I talked for the world. This number for a country like India and other developing parts of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa is actually 11%. So this is the part about the unjust piece of this transition and why it's appropriate for India to take, a, take an aspiration which is further out. Uh, and by the way, many of the commentators who are even here today have also made that comment, right? How it's lower cost for India to push it out by a certain amount. But if we were to hit a 2050, or we were, if we were to have to hit 2050, we have to spend 11% of our GDP um, in these assets, which will be a substantial, almost 50% more than what we are spending today uh, in these kinds of assets. And the interesting thing is the other extreme, which is China, Japan, and, and the US, which have to spend somewhere between four and 6% of their GDP in this transition. If you go to the next page, 11, here's another depiction of how it's uneven. On the complicated charts, so I'll take a second to, to explain it. Um, so the transition exposure, on the, on the y-axis, you have the transition exposure score, which is combination of jobs in the sectors which make need to change the most. I'll come back and describe those in a minute. Um, the G, proportion of the GDP and the capital stock that lies in those sectors. And on the x-axis, it's the richness of the country, the GDP per capita. And as you can see, the developing nations are on top left, left and there's a straight line. I mean, it's a pretty significant correlation on who has to spend and how much effort uh, to get there. Um, and, and you know, clearly two categories of countries, the ones that either generate fossil, fossil fuels, in the previous page you saw some of those, or developing countries are the most exposed uh, in, in this. The other interesting angle is the color of the bubbles here. The size of the bubbles corresponds to the size of the nation, in population terms. But the color of the bubbles is interesting, right? The blacker it is, the darker it is, the more impacted we will be by the physical risks. And we will have uh, uh, more and more, more, more climate refugees, if I might call them that. Uh, and you can again see the developing nations have the most, uh, most of those. So most impacted, the most to spend, uh, the most transition to make at some level 
if we are to meet the 2050 goal, all the more reason why we need that extra time uh, around this. If you go to the next one, next page, uh, which is the um, sectoral view on the uneven nature of the transition. So 30% of the first GDP, the first four rows here are the most impacted. Again, complicated chart, so let me explain it. On the rows here, you see different sectors, fossil fuel producers, consume, pro producers of those products that produce carbon dioxide or nitrous oxides and so on. Uh, emitters and core operations, the conversion industries like steel and cement, the sectors that buy carbon embedded products, so consumer, product, consumer companies, construction, I might even include automotive and other steel, uh, aluminum, uh, cement user, cement user, of course, is construction. And then 69% of the world's GDP, which has less exposure uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the transition that has to occur. So one third of the world's GDP, which is higher for countries like India and China, has greater exposure to the climate change. And then on the x-axis, uh, the horizontal, you see where they have more exposure, right? So the emitters and core operations have of course, in their operations themselves, significant exposure. The, the fossil fuel producers and the fossil fuel dependent product producers like automotive have product exposure, what they make. Some have electricity exposure and some have other input exposure. So that's the x-axis depending on where their emissions come from. And as you can see, the actions that have to come from these sectors or countries that dominate these sectors has to be different. So fossil fuel producing countries basically have to transform their portfolios. Saudi Arabia has to move from oil to hydrogen. Also well endowed in uh, renewables, so should be able to make that transition should they put their minds to it. Uh, and uh, producers of automotive equipment machinery, which actually use the fossil fuel uh, and generate carbon dioxide, have to also transition their portfolios through products that will not that will use more of electricity and green electricity. Emitters and core, core operations, power being the largest, steel and cement, uh, these have to transform again, rip out old assets, meaning coal-based power generation, coal-based steel making, and put in new assets in place. And then the users of inputs have to buy differently. In some ways, they have to take the consumer pressure, which has to then transmit to them, and then they have to apply pressure backwards and be willing to pay for the transition. Why are there you know, eventually passing this on to their consumers. And of course, force and work with their suppliers to innovate and help them innovate. And perhaps even lowering the bar in some places. For example, uh, does the steel that go into the car, when it's green and it's coming from recycled sources, does it need to have the same level of spec as it may have today? So they also have to transmit demand signals as well as demand and, and spec shifts back to their customer, back to their supplier base. You go to the next page, um, which then talks about the jobs impact, well talked about. And, and, and let me also say, so the summary here from our research is 200 million, million dollar, 200 million person a job increases, 185 million dollar, billion job decreases, not much, it's a wash. Now that's not to say that individuals will not get impacted. So this is going to be a huge human issue. Individuals will get impacted, Sectors will get impacted. As you can see, oil, gold, gas, and coal will lose 30 odd million jobs. Uh, and places like Eastern India, which are dependent on these sectors, will, there will be a significant impact. Yet, if you put this in a wider context, this is not that big a transition. Partly because many of the sectors that have to transition that we are talking about are more capital intensive than job intensive. Just to put this in context, just for India, the impact of digital on Jobs in India is about 60 million jobs, retrained people, additional jobs that get created, 60 million, right? 100 million probably need to come off our farms in the same period, maybe even 150 million need to come off our farms. And we probably add, in a relatively short time frame, 15 odd years, 100 million to our workforce. So the jobs challenge, I think is dwarfed, though it's talked about a lot, it's dwarfed by other forces that will impact jobs. If you go to the next page, uh, let me move to the from uh, move to one other element of uneven, which is costs. And just look at the first bar and the second bar for power, cement, and steel. First set of bars, first bar in the row, and the yes. first bar. Good evening. 
So if you look at that, um, there's going to be inflation. Okay. Costs are going to increase, particularly morning, in the I'll short term. The costs have to increase to accommodate increased investment that has to go into the power sector, the steel sector, and the cement sector, cement sector. And the range of cost increases that you see here are between 20 and 50%. So somebody has to pay for this. And if you take a country like India, if the cars or the scooters or the homes are more expensive by 40, 45%, because a lot of the construction cost in India is not the finishing elements, but the core construction elements of steel and cement, then particularly for the poor, what's the method of compensating them as we as a country embark on grabbing the opportunities and serving the world on this transition. If you go to the next page then, um, maybe I'll, so maybe briefly it is exposed to risks. I will talk about one of these risks, which is the supply constraint and price volatility that we are likely to see. So I see this happening with my clients already. Uh, those that are producing gray EBITDA, gray carbon, I mean, are emitting carbon in, on the basis of that, are producing more EBITDA, are basically beginning to reconsider their investments. The demand in a country like India is still going to be there for gray steel, for gray aluminum, for some even gray power. My, my expectation, we are beginning to see shortages in that. PLFs for coal-based plants are beginning to rise. And maybe by the middle of dec the decade, we'll be short for base load power, right? But the investment may not come, right? So we are going to see price increases for those commodities. We're going to see volatility. We're going to see potentially underinvestment. And then on the other side of things, uh, the demand signals for green products, and this is true particularly in Europe, increasingly so, so in Korea, Japan, possibly in the US, we're gonna see the demand signals are already in place for green aluminum, green steel, green power, and exceed the supply in many of these sectors. The supply hasn't quite kept up, is not yet keeping up. So we're gonna see price, price increases, and I'll, if I get time, show some evidence for that. For example, maybe let me talk about that. For example, for our pet, recycled pet, recycled polypropylene, the, the, the scrap-based product, in effect, the prices of these products are trending up already. So we're gonna see volatility and we're gonna see, uh, we're gonna see price increases for this. If you go to the next page then, um, I'm gonna, so you know, India will similarly see not only cost increases, volatility, but also the potential if we do go down the path to 2050, uh, if regulatory pushes of that nature come in some sectors, we're gonna see stranded assets. It just talks about coal assets where $200 billion of coal assets could go stranded. And by the way, real examples, we've just made the Bharat 6 transition for our cars. Those assets are not gonna run down in 10, 15 years necessarily. And we may make the transition towards EVs in that time frame. So we are gonna see stranded assets in many, many sectors as we make this transition. Quite extreme if we choose 2050 in some sectors, less extreme if the economics transition faster or uh, in some other sectors. If you go to the next uh, chart, uh, maybe you go to the next one. I think there is also an opportunity. I talked about the opportunity from the investment, but for a country like India, um, there is opportunity. The top, top part of this is the solar potential. We are pretty well endowed on that front amongst the lowest cost solar producers, solar energy producers in the world. Very high um, investments, third largest also. Wind a less, little less so, so we see opportunity for India. Consequently, for hydrogen, combined with uh, highly skilled manpower, the ability to build, build plants for less, uh, ability to do engineered products for less, so equipment for hydro, uh, for electrolysis, solar equipment, which we haven't done in the past. So I think these bunch of things point us to opportunities. If you look at materials on the next page, that too has some opportunities on rare earths, on zinc. Zinc, we've realized. Hindustan zinc is one of the largest producers of zinc in the world. Rare earths, we haven't, but we should. So some of the commodities, cobalt, copper, lithium, nickel, uh, we are not as well endowed in. These are the commodities of the future, but who we are. So we have to leverage these opportunities. Um, if we go to the next section now, if you can skip through this and go to the next section, let me talk a minute or two about the opportunity. I, I know I'm running out of time. So if you go to the next page, these are the areas, this is, this is a five, seven year view, this $5 trillion of uh, incremental addressable view for decarbonization, nothing unexpected. The biggest sectors are low carbon mobility, low carbon power, scrap, uh, circular products and packaging, waste management and water, low carbon agri chains, hydrogen potentially in the later part of the decade where some of the investments will happen now, higher efficiency buildings, less so in India, 
uh, we don't consume we consume more electricity and less uh, uh, heating uh, uh, fuel industrial decarbonization again the technologies still have to settle here uh, as well as ccu as carbon markets so these are the opportunity areas if you go to the next page this is where, where companies have to focus uh, so this again complicated for a little for 10 companies each 10 with green EBITDA, 10 with gray EBITDA. This is the market to book ratios, right? So what is happening in the stock markets for these companies? Now the stock markets do have bubbles, I realize that, but they are also often an indicator of what's coming in the future. The market to book for the green EBITDA companies, and a lot of these are in the energy sector where the transition, the technology, the adoption, all of these are further ahead, more mature, is four and a half. While the average market to book for the energy producers or the converters, like a steel company, ArcelorMittal, Tata Steel, uh, is one and a half. So it's 3x already. The markets are beginning to recognize that the demand for green products exceeds supply and so on. So huge opportunity, um, huge opportunity uh, here. If you go to the next page, this is one example. Acre Solutions or is a, is a Scandinavian company. Uh, the role of the company or the work the company has been doing is renewables and field development, oil field development, um, subsea, EMM, those kinds of things. If you look, focus yourself on the right side of this chart, the black piece is the market pack cap of the core business that this company does. $27 billion, billion uh, Norwegian kroners of this company of revenues comes from their core business. Very little, about a billion kroners comes from the new businesses which you see on, on top, the light blue and the dark and the royal blue, which is revenues that come from their services that they provide on the offshore wind and carbon capture side. Very little revenue, but as they have exposed these arms of their businesses to the market, a larger amount of market cap, 2x almost, 1.8x being generated off the current mother company that was there. So this is again, I think, pre it, 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 it envisages the future from a corporate perspective. If you go on to the next page, uh, so implications for Indian companies, what should Indian companies be doing? First and foremost, Indian companies ought to be making a value creation. I mean, there's upside for those that export, for example, products to the to Europe, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, the, the, the carbon price, almost hundred euros uh, today, actually gives us an opportunity to produce this some pr same products in a decarbonized manner here and to be able to occupy that market. So assess, if we come at it from a value creation perspective, there's opportunities for Indian companies. Second one, play offense. Look for the downsides. What, will, what markets will you get shut out of? What costs will you have to incur? But also look for upsides. There are going to be pockets of opportunities. In addition to taking 50 year, 30 year targets, take short term targets because without that, companies won't, your people won't move. This is for companies. Build adjacent part of playing offense is build adjacent green businesses, so scrap based businesses, for example. Can you import scrap, convert? low carbon, create low carbon products, realize premium, as I talked about on some of those products. Uh, there are premium premiums to be had, for example, on green steel. The other one, fifth, is be programmatic. So lots of programs, I work in Indian companies, lots of little, little things. What are they adding up to? Are they adding up to your full target? And do you need programs um, behind this? Or are you stuck in the pilot purgatory? Last one. This whole journey is going to be inherently uncertain. Price volatility, demand volatility, regulatory uncertainty. And their companies have to put strategies together that look around the corner, that predict a bit of the future, and will have to take risks. So in some ways, uh, you will have to put strategies in place which you can act on piecemeal and trigger when you see some big external changes occur, demand signals occur. And in some cases, companies can, those who have, have the ability can make bold bets behind this. And we do hear some announcements from large companies in India uh, around this. Let me bring that to a pause. Again, the main message is being, the transition is uneven, it's risky, it's rich with opportunities for companies. They have to set themselves up to win the transition and play offense. Thank you. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you very much. That was a really rich exposition uh, of a report that does deserve, to my mind, a much deeper study. So I can say that you've certainly stimulated my interest in going into it more deeply. And I'm sure that's true for others. Now, our next, uh, the person who was going to comment uh, was Vaibhav Chaturvedi. Uh, he has to leave rather early. So Vaibhav, first of all, thank you for agreeing to stay back. Uh, Webber is a fellow at the CEEW, one of our leading think tanks working in energy, environment, and water. And he's been working on developing a modeling ecosystem, uh, looking really at uh, climate change, energy interactions, and has been deeply involved in advising the government. So with that very brief introduction, let me ask Webber to comment. Thank you, Mr. Alwalia. Uh, very good evening to all the colleagues on the call, and thank you, Rajat, for this very stimulating, very interesting uh, and deep presentation. Uh, I look forward to understanding more of the report. Uh, so, in terms of the points I want to make, the first point I think I want to make is about economics, and economics not in sense of the numbers. I, I, I will talking about economic narrative. And I think that is what I find most interesting about this particular report. Uh, people like me who have been into the climate debate very long, or at least over a decade now, uh, decarbonization has always been about economic transformation. But you know, unfortunately, we have not managed to uh, convince most of the economists in, in the country and abroad. Right? Now, what Net Zero does, I think it does something very, very uh, interesting. So Net Zero gives a, a lot of certainty to the decarbonization debate. Because earlier, for India, decarbonization simply means emission intensity of zero. Now, that's a very different thing compared to a very hard, certain target of net zero uh, and it is and what it has done is it is uh, uh, it is sort of pushed the mainstreaming of this economic narrative around decarbonization which is i think a great step because so till now it is a very marginal environmental climate debate now it is i think shifting in a big way and the report i see i think a very important contribution uh, in, in that direction so that is my first point the second point i want to make is now beyond economics, there is also the political economy, and businesses need to deal with the political uh, economy challenges uh, of the transformation. And one big, uh, rather, you know, example of uh, political economy, which aligns very well with the, uh, you know, business strategies and impact on competitiveness, is about uh, distribution sector reforms, essentially power pricing reforms in India. Uh, we know the cross subsidy that exists in the Indian market. One of the big uh, results that we see in our analysis also, and I'm sure all other analysis, whichever have looked at net zero, is about deep electrification of the industrial sector. For example, I will talk about India only, not about other economies. Uh, in India, the, the share of electricity and energy, industrial energy use is around 17, 18%. And the reason is very obvious, electricity is so expensive. Right? And we know it is not, it, it is only one part of the debate. There's whole the distribution sector financial mess, uh, and the continuous bailouts that we throw at the distributed sector every five, six years or so, somehow we have not managed to solve the problem. Right? But this is fundamental because time and again, it has also been highlighted that uh, pricing reforms are also a very important element for competitiveness of India's uh, you know, industrial sector. And in absence of uh, these sort of pricing reforms, if electricity continues to be so expensive, neither we will be able to achieve the goals of the competitiveness or higher share of manufacturing, nor will we be able to decarbonize. Now, this is only one example of the political economy, big political economy challenge uh, that uh, you know companies have to deal with, and somehow the policy makers have to bite the bullet uh, sooner than later, hopefully. And this is only one example. You know, it could be uh, the issue around coal dependent states. How will they react to any reform agenda? It could be about Indian railways. You know, most of the revenue of Indian railways is about co is around coal haulage. What will Indian Railways do? How 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 will it cross subsidize, uh, you know, passenger traffic, which it does currently, based on freight sector, uh, you know, revenue. Now a lot of interesting issues around political economy, which I think need to be understood better. So that was the second point: economics and then political economy. The third point I want to make is, uh, you know, when will India get space for deep reform again? You know, fiscal reforms. We have been trying for so long now. And we tried to address this when we talked about, uh, you know, 20, when we said 2070 uh, as a net zero target is something ambitious, still realistic. And the argument when we gave, you know, as many of the colleagues here on the call would know, uh, we did, you know, four scenarios, 50, 60, 70, 80 for net zero. 
and we we said say, 2070 but the argument behind it was a pure economic argument so we simply started asking a question that if india when india becomes rich uh, even after become, attaining a rich or high income status should india keep on asking for like 40 50 years for becoming a net zero economy now the india's whole debate of or the whole positioning of climate policy is about development right so development cannot be compromised at any cost and which is a very logical kind of position right so if the question becomes if you are already rich and if you are already a high income economy then you have already addressed the development concerns right so then we we do see many of the you know stakeholders including you know, high level officials everybody agreeing to this larger point that when the when country becomes rich of course we don't need another 50 years for achieving net zero then the question becomes okay what does rich mean and when does india become rich and in fact a lot of what i am saying is already written in op-ed in, in some newspapers so i'm just repeating it our colleagues might have already read this so the question becomes what is rich and when does india become rich so that is where the world bank definition you know it says uh, india i mean any country that crosses around 12500 us dollars per capita uh, i think in 2020 dollar terms it is a it officially becomes a rich income or a high income economy or rich economy right uh, india currently is just is less than $2000 per capita china is around 10000 so china is expected to enter the officially enter the high income club somewhere around maybe 20 28 or so india is expected to enter around somewhere around 2055 or so. you know going by the growth expectation that even international uh, you know estimates tell us now after 2055 we simply say well you will have you know india will become a rich in, in economy which simply means you will have a lot of fiscal space to maybe address many complicated reforms which we are not able to do right. For example, the distribution sector mess, uh, which we are in currently right now, because we, we are not able to raise domestic prices, maybe that challenge will go away in 25, 30 years from, from, from now, just because of you know, economic growth and the fiscal resources that come, come with it. And if 2055 is that kind of marker year, maybe the economy does not need more than 50, 20 years for becoming a net zero economy. It's a plain, very clean kind of economic argument. It simply says, you know, 2070 is, you could think about 2070. And of course, if technology is permit, you should do earlier. You should always advance in zero year because climate impact is very important. But the, the broad point I'm making, this whole perspective of economics in the reform agenda uh, is also um, uh, something very important. We have been highlighting it. I think this report also does an excellent job uh, of, of doing that. And finally, I want to say, what are the potential strategies? So after understanding of let's say econo economic narrative, political economy, uh, you know uh, the reform agenda, potential strategies, I think they do lie in terms of engaging heavily with citizens as well as labor unions. I think engaging with labor unions is absolutely critical. Whenever we see some effort of distribution sector reforms in any state, the first thing we hear about is labor union going on strike, and the state kind of walks two steps back. Now, unless you actually engage in a meaningful way with labor unions in the energy sector, and we have got pretty big and powerful labor unions in the energy sector across the value chain, unless you are able to engage them in a meaningful way, it will be very difficult to create, a, you know, a, to actually implement reforms. So that is one. The second is engagement with citizens. That is the second thing. I think that is also absolutely important. Uh, and, uh, and we will need to do it at some point of time in a much more wider and meaningful way. The third is about carbon pricing. I think the Bureau of Energy Efficiency is already, uh, already kind of have a framework for an emission trading scheme. So India, I think sooner or later is going to adopt an emission trading scheme. They have a plan, it's already out, or the white paper is already out there, which simply means, uh, well, uh, the economy will have a carbon, formal carbon pricing uh, in some time, you know, which will have its very interesting implications. But that is also an important strategy and the government is already moving in that direction, which is great. The final thing I want to say is that, uh, you know, in, we have we hear a lot about co-benefit narrative. You know? A co-benefit narrative, narrative is kind of I, I would say it's the darling narrative, you know, of everybody. You know? Increasingly, I am kind of getting disillusioned by this narrative. Uh, and because you know, uh, I don't think any manufacturer has done anything or any electric vehicles have come in either from the consumer side or the or the producer side because of this co-benefit narrative. Anybody has not done anything. It has been there in text, but no, no progress has happened. I think a much more compelling narrative is about macroeconomic transformation. So I think that is a much more compelling narrative. And, and that, that is where this report and many other efforts which are trying to make this compelling macroeconomic narrative, which is about jobs, which is about economic growth, which is about exports, which is about border carbon adjustments, what is happening in Europe. 
now there is no you know wishy washy co benefit narrative it is a hard mainstream macroeconomic narrative which is going beyond co benefit narrative which we all of us use so widely uh, so uh, that, that is the final point i want to make in terms of four strategies engagement with labor unions citizens carbon pricing and going beyond the co benefit narrative towards a much more harder and front and center macroeconomic narrative is what i will think uh, will be really, you know uh, hopefully help us in moving in the direction of Uh, the net zero in a much more smoother way because we want a smoother transition. We don't want any economic shocks in the transition. So uh, I, I hope, uh, yeah, that that is the direction in which we move. Thank you so much. Sorry for the background noise. I'm at the airport, but happy to hear uh, colleagues of the call. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vibhav. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. I know under high pressure, uh, and we'll reflect. Uh, you won't be able to hear. Rajesh's response to the points that you made, but I think one of our colleagues will be able to brief you on that. But very nice. The next speaker who's going to comment on the presentation is Rahul Tongya, who's a senior fellow at CSEP, works in the area of energy uh, and uh, uh, natural resources sustainability group in the CSEP. Uh, Rahul is also adjunct professor at Carnegie Mellon. And has been advising the government in various uh, committees, etc., that relate to climate change. So, just the right kind of background uh, to comment on uh, the McKinsey study. Uh, Rajat, would you like to? Sorry, uh, I mean Rahul, are you? I can't see you, but you must be on one of those. Um, am Am I audible and visible? Yes, you are now both audible and visible. So, welcome. Thank you, and hopefully my slides are showing. Just I have three slides uh, for these three points. Uh, are are they visible? Yep, very visible. Thank you. So Rajat, thank you for the presentation. And I think the the, the phrase that comes to mind is every challenge is an opportunity if you pivot, if you re rework. And the the only lament to be slightly uh, cynical if or, or facetious is well, uh, hopefully it's not the same uh, thinking or group that got us into this mess is 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 going to be the ones who save us. So maybe we do need new stakeholders to this. So I want to really talk about net zero because you use the terminology in a manner that a lot of people may or may not quite get what that really means, and then talk a little bit about specifics of what we need to do or could do, and then what may or may not be missing in 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 in, in this discussion. So first is, I mean, we have a paper, uh, it's on our CSEP website, where I talk about an alternative to net zero. Now, this doesn't mean net zero is going away, it's a good thing. But the question is, what could we do that's a little better? And what really matters is the cumulative emissions that any country uh, or entity would be putting out. And so net zero doesn't tell us how much you're going to emit it just tells you the date by which you're going to zero and the cumulative emissions is a very big deal that's that's missing um the second important thing uh, you'd alluded to is 2050 repeatedly and this is a discussion that needs to happen i mean politically it's already been settled at least to some extent that some countries china 2060 india 2070 has been announced of course they can always ratchet or accelerate but at a design level should we be expecting all countries to zero by 2050? And I think the obvious answer is no. And that fundamentally changes how we choose our infrastructure design going forward. What we really need is the high emitters, not just rich. There's a strong overlap, but China falls in the category of high emitters as well, just using 1990 onwards data. If you ignore the historical emissions even before that. And so uh, the... Obvious answer is if they have to get to uh, by 2035, that leaves a little carbon space and decision making different for developing and low emitting countries. A second problem is the, the use of the word net. And here there's a lot of uh, ink spilled as well as debate on are these accounting tricks? What's really going on? And unfortunately, in the short term, it is still financial in a manner that's not even very accurate or, or fair. So for example, the, the physics isn't necessarily syncing with what the finance is saying. So CEO of Delta Airlines proudly mentions that he spent $30 million and they are now net zero. If that were the true cost and it were linear, 
That means $24 billion is all it would take for the world to net zero. But we know that this is a voluntary market and it's a lot of you know, uh, left and right balancing. And so if we use the analogy of uh, Irfan Omer put it with indulgences uh, in, in history, they won't buy our way to heaven. They will just slow down our descent into hell. A more subtle point on these offsets is on the, the fact that they are unfair to countries like India and, and to the poor. McKinsey, 2007 estimated, had very nice marginal abatement cost curves, the MEC curves, um, which many of us would be familiar with, which were essentially a framing that says to reduce emissions, different technologies or different solutions have a cost. And it's more like a ladder. So there are different steps of different width or different total emissions. And obviously there's an average cost, but each step you have to start with the lowest rung. The problem is offsets mean that the rich don't take care of their high cost tail of emissions and they buy or, or use the carbon space of others at a lower cost to avoid actually coming down to zero. And so that's a significant problem. And so when we studied this question of how much do you emit by a date of say 2050 in the paper on flattening the curve and cumulative emissions, uh, we, we, we talked about let's model net zero and assume that each country continues for a few years or uh, depending on where they are as is business as usual and then takes 30 years to reach zero. So this was just a standardization for lack of better data. I won't go into all the details, but the larger point on this graph is that uh, if the high emissions countries uh, want to uh, stay within a 1.5 degree rise as per a reasonable carbon budget prorata for them, then they don't have 30 years. So if they zero out by 2050, they're actually over emitting. And so the only way that that could work out is either the poor under emit, or we have to actually have extractive technologies, which is very, very expensive. So the um, issue that I worry about is we're focusing on a compliance sort of world instead of the actual heavy hifting, hitting that needs to be done, accounting shifts and not real change. This is IPCC's newest report, uh, came out yesterday uh, or, or day before, and it's already this slide. I've just chopped off what was a sort of contiguous slide to make it fit. And this shows the different segments like energy, land use, buildings, et cetera, and different subtopics and how much potential there is for emissions reduction at what cost. And so the costs for the blue are the best. They are less than zero. They're not just no regrets. They actually save you money. And most of the blue is now what I would call the new business as usual. So wind energy, solar energy, this dominates energy efficiency, like in buildings. These are no brainers and we're doing them anyways. So the first catch is how we do our accounting. You have climate finance debates where people are giving loans for solar power in developing countries and counting that as climate finance. That shouldn't be the way we do this accounting. The larger problem is, of course, what happens when we run out of low hanging fruit that we want to tap? So there is an enormous premium it's not just mid colors, it's over $100. If you read, read the footnotes in the IPCC, they say we are probably underestimating the costs of those very expensive uh, emissions reductions that are out there. And so there is a premium. So this gets me to the last point, which is the rich versus uh, poorer countries. Uh, who should be paying that premium? And it's the developed countries that need to be paying the premium to get rid of these uh, expensive emissions through new technologies, green hydrogen, uh, cement changes. Developing countries should still have the space to do it as efficiently as possible, but limit the burden they have in the short run upon their economies. Uh, uh, the way forward, I think, in a place like India, like you mentioned, would be uh, sectoral. So I think the power sector is definitely one that needs a lot more attention. Web have talked about uh, discoms. It's more than just discoms. Uh, we've done a lot of grid modeling, granular for 2030. The good news is high RE is cost effective, even without storage, but batteries are not yet cost effective. It's a whole separate discussion on what that does or doesn't mean. But the larger point is we should be thinking for developing countries like India. If we think about cumulative emissions, we should 
to use COVID's phrase, flatten the curve. This is two different areas of emissions over time. The blue is the sort of more traditional where it's a sharp rise and then a sharp fall. And instead, if countries could flatten the curve, they take longer to peak. They peak later, but lower and zero out lower. You actually have either the same or lower total emissions at a lower cost. But if the narrative is always zero by 2050, you lose this opportunity for developing countries that they may need. And so that is something uh, perhaps missing from the discourse. Last two small points in your slides. Um, you, you talked uh, a little bit about stranded for, uh, assets. I think if we have a tail period of time left for developing countries, we shouldn't think of existing coal fleet as a stranded asset risk because A, there's enough time, B, they will be crowded out by cleaner solutions sooner more than later. And India's coal fleet is relatively young. Half its coal capacity came online between FY11 and 16. South Africa, they're talking about this transition bailout or support from the rest of the world. Their average coal plants are close to 30 years. US average age is 37 or 38 years. It's a very different story for countries with high growth in demand and needs. So if we talk about coal, I mean, the, the, the whole Glasgow, uh, there was a lot of debate on terminology and semantics over coal, phase down, wind down, et cetera, phase out. But instead of focusing just on coal or any technology, it's all technologies that have to zero out at some point. And natural gas is something the developed world uses more of because they have it, not because they were trying to be much cleaner. So we need to focus on the Pareto, which is let countries like India worry, uh, focus on getting rid of 80% of their emissions instead of that residual 20. That early action that you talked about is, is definitely something more that India needs. Uh, and the transition will have to be thought through. I quibble with one of your points on agriculture, at least in India, I don't see net job gains because there's so many more people. You yourself said we need to get people out of agriculture. So I don't see the transition actually doing it. And the transition, it's, not, it's a non-transition risk. Um, I can link to a paper I have on agriculture and jobs. It's far, far worse in the agricultural section. Um, so for Indian companies, just using your same sort of flow, I think they need to work with the government to get regulatory clarity. Don't rely on regulatory support except for bootstrapping, but clarity can help. Uh, a lot of the cost isn't just about how cheap is your factory or a product, but are system level issues like in the power sector, um, infrastructure design when you talk of grass, gas, for example. It's not just the, the product, but the system. Focus on niches would be another suggestion, because as I like to remind my colleagues around the world, a niche in India is bigger than a country in Europe. And then in the power sector, uh, of course, uh, Weber have talked about BISCOM problems. We need to make the entire grid a lot more nimble, a lot smarter, and a lot more resilient. That's a five, 10 year journey, if not longer, ahead of us. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rahul. Um, hang on, I think I'm mute, right? No, we can hear you. I'm okay. Sure. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rahul. I'm sure that Rajat will pick up on some of those points. Let me get to our third discussant. That's uh, Swati D'Souza from the International Energy Agency. She's the India lead analyst and coordinator in the whole area of energy transition climate policy. So Swati, can I request you to make your comments, please? Thank you, Dr. Alivalia. Rahul, can you not share? I want to share my screen. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I have uh, two or three very quick points to make. One, I love the phrase opportunity uh, because I think we're going to need that and a lot more of the opportunity. Um, you're seeing the shift in the industry in US and Europe, particularly in oil and gas, where the US oil and gas companies have not yet moved towards transition while European majors are actually moving towards transition. And that sort of is a lesson for India, even in the EV space where you have a Tata Nexon coming out with an electric and, you know, Maruti commenting on the fact that the Indian market is still not uh, ready for electric vehicles. So who moves, uh, who gets the first more advantage 
is a big factor within the industry segment. So I love the word opportunity, but um, there are certain costs that come with this opportunity. And I'm just going to share my screen very quickly. Um, in terms of the, sorry, can everybody see my screen? Yep. Um, Would you make so, it full screen perhaps? Yeah, just one second. So this is something that we did last year where we tried to look at all the coal consuming sectors, the major ones, which cover about 95% of the coal in the country. We try to look at the geographical spread, the number of people employed in the sector, and what is who are these people? What is the socioeconomic profile of these people? And if you see the screen, this is just a brief summarization. So when Rajat mentions the point uneven, this is how uneven it's going to be for states in India. We all know that the eastern and the south and the central eastern states are going to be the most impacted. But how are they going to be the most impacted? This is slide number one. Slide number two, when we talk about transitions and when we look at net zero transitions, we cannot run away from coal transitions. Um, if we look at coal transitions, the conversation and the point that Weber mentioned right at the beginning when he said, we have to engage communities, we have to engage citizens and we have to engage unions because there's an entire coal economy that's over and beyond the formal sector jobs that are highly dependent on coal. So when we are looking at net zero, um, uh, a net zero trajectory, this portion becomes very, very critical. The third part of it is um, who are these people? What is the socioeconomic profile? We know the iron and steel industry is one of the biggest um, energy uh, consumers, as well as from an emissions perspective. Uh, but who are the people who are actually employed in this iron and steel industry? What is their education profile? Um, can they be transitioned? If yes, to what sectors can they be transitioned? If we need to think of net zero transitions, can we think of net zero transitions from a labor perspective? The creation of jobs, I'm going to stop um, sharing. Um, the creation of jobs is important, yes, but what kind of jobs are these going to be? Are these going to be a gig economy job? Are they going to be pensionable jobs? What is the quality of the jobs that we are talking about? Because we don't yet have an EV supply chain in the country. Most of our, barring the top 10% in iron and steel, most of them are in the MSME sector. The auto industry you do have major manufacturers, but they, but a lot of this is assembly line. You have clusters with MSME enterprises who make these parts. Is transition for these industries a viable option? Because while we were making this report, I spoke to sponge iron manufacturers across the northern belt of the country, about 40, 50 sponge iron manufacturers, to get a sense of what they think of the transition. Because most of the sponge iron in India is made from DRI, which is, which uses coking, uh, which uses non-coking coal. Um, they were unwilling to shift to natural gas. Forget any other technology. Natural gas, which is commercially viable, which exists in the country, barring India, all other countries who produce DRI uh, steel actually produce it from natural gas. They there was no movement from any of these guys. And why then, if we look at the unevenness of the components related to transition and then put that in the framework of opportunity. What do we get? We get that over the next 20 years, we are going to put up about 100 million tons of uh, steel capacity in the country. Over the next 10 to 15 years, we are going to add to electric vehicles. Over the next 10, 15 years, we are going to add to cement capacity in the country. And I'm only talking about industry because this discussion pertains to the industry sector. Um, so when we look at it from an opportunity point of view, um, sometimes this, so from a capital perspective, we will not be, we will not fall short for the large industries. What about for the MSME industries? Do we have a separate financing mechanism for the MSME industries where credit is easier 
because a lot of them are margin players at the end of the day and they are the ones who need to make the shift without them making the shift at least 40% of our industrial um, emissions is not going to go away anytime soon so these are i think and i'm going to stop over here but these are i think some aspects that we need to keep into uh, to take into account when we talk about industry transitioning um labor uh, uh, my last point is going to be on labor the fact of the matter is we are seeing increasing contractualization of labor and that may not be that bad a thing because it reduces cost for the industry and sort of also interplays with the um, with the full time uh, employment definition that uh, uh, th that comes from green jobs um but is this labor but but the, but do this the, will this labor also get social security benefits going forward we don't yet have a supply chain in place whatever social security benefits <clears throat> exist exist in the fossil fuel industry so when we are looking at the opportunity we look at the opportunity not just for industry but to sort of transform the labor market in the country because most of our labor is still informal most look at it from transforming some amount uh, some amount of transformation in the education system because a lot of the people barely i think uh, as per the uh, labor force participation data about i think 1 or 2% are the only uh, is the only number of people with a post graduate degree so a transition just doesn't mean one thing it actually will see a transformation across different segments of the economy i'm going to stop here thank you very much thank you thank you very much uh, swati uh, our last uh, discussant is indu murthy uh, from c step in bengaluru <clears throat> she also works in the area of climate sustainability climate environment etc uh, so indu would you like to make your comments now thank you dr ralwalia and uh, first and foremost i would like to uh, uh, thank rajat for making such a crisp presentation of such a wonderful report quite a complex uh, uh, issue at the end of it so uh, to begin with you know i just wanted to kind of come in uh, with the comment that uh, you know i think the overall uh, macroeconomic impact narrative uh, is great to some extent but then i think we uh, we really need to kind of move from a techno economic narrative to looking at you know the social and political uh, issues related to it uh, swati kind of alluded to it when we were talking about you know coal power the eastern districts eastern regions of india so on and so forth uh, in fact uh, the the recent very recent report of ipcc very clearly uh, even says that you know there are close linkages between uh, mitigation adaptation and development pathways so i think having a development narrative becomes extremely important uh, particularly in the case of india where we are looking at uh, you know uh, trying to kind of meet the developmental goals of you know providing 24/7 electricity clean water clean cooking fuel maintaining food security so on and so forth so it it becomes extremely important to keep that perspective in mind uh maybe not a co benefit narrative but definitely trying to look at what are the trade offs how could we actually minimize the trade offs that would become extremely uh, important to look at uh mentioning trade offs i also uh, wanted to kind of bring in this uh, uh the point that rajit talked about increase higher increase in the green power now when you're looking at higher increase in the green power obviously we are uh, looking at issues of competition for land and water so there again we are uh, competing with food production if we are looking at ethanol uh, you know sugarcane is the primary source so obviously it's a very water intensive crop <coughs> there again we are looking at and uh, wonderful thing that i saw in this particular report is the climate angle also that's been brought in into the narrative but however i think moving forward it's important to realize that we are looking at a wetter and a warmer future but again the variability is going to be much larger so probably you we are looking at areas where there are going to be largely scarcity of water so bringing in issues of uh, uh, you know competition for land and water in these issues again is a complex thing that we will have to deal with uh, as we go forward and of course job shifts it does seem like a 
uh, you know, not a very large thing, but then skill development is at the heart of it. Unless we kind of bring in skill development, I don't think there is a possibility of looking into uh, transitions into newer areas. And I definitely, uh, you know, agree with Rahul saying that when it comes to agriculture, we are not looking at transition. That's a no-go area uh, as it is. And emissions, yes, but then, but beyond that, we cannot look at people mass transition into different kinds of uh, job skills. So that's not going to be happening at all. Uh, and of course, at the end of it, I think we need to be cognizant of the fact that uh, when we start looking at it from a macroeconomic perspective, it's, it's great to some extent, but the distributional impacts of it is something that's very, very uh, large. And so lower income households might end up paying much more than that. And talking about you know behavioral change or getting engagement with the community without meeting the development aspirations, I don't think we can actually even get into a conversation on uh, you know getting people to buy in things that we are pushing for. Uh, so that's in a nutshell that I wanted to bring to the table uh, around what's been discussed so far. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> that's a lot of very interesting points. Now, Rajat, I, I'm sure you made certain notes and there are issues that I might want to bring up, but how would you like to? Would you like to first sort of have a first go at responding to those comments that struck you as particularly um, important? I'm sure they're all important, but some would have struck you as especially so. And then we we'll pick happy up to, whatever. I'm, I'm happy to do that, maybe very briefly. Uh, yeah. So you can then also provide your comments. Um, Wanting. I think uh, maybe just Weber's comments, I, I kind of all three, I uh, quite agree with. I think the fact that net zero, and if you just take India, provides a bookend is extraordinary. And I think, I hope that we will truly come up with an aligned national plan, which we can, of course, modify as we learn more and as technology develops and adoption happens. But we will come up with a plan which will then provide us some degree of regulatory certainty. This thing about going to Bharat 6 and then very quickly going to zero uh, ICE vehicles, that kind of mistake is not something, I mean, of course, if it happens, it happens because technology moved much quicker or something else that happened, but it should not happen because of the lack of foresight, right? It should not happen because the, we did not think enough, right? So I think that bookend point is absolutely right. It, it forces, it should force our mind. I hope we, through debates of this nature and uh, through work that the policymakers do with, uh, with with thinkers like yourselves, many of you here who I know work with policymakers, we actually create a national plan that's reasonably well aligned, which is also flexible and agile in its nature. I think the second question on should India wait or should India act? I think, frankly, in our own interest, uh, we should we should act now. And I also agree that we should define co-benefits differently. We should define it as real value creation for our nation. 75, 80 percent of what India will be in roads and steel plants and chemical plants, et cetera, et cetera, in 2050 has not been built today, 28 years uh, ahead. So it's not been built today. So can we just, as much as is possible, put the right regulatory signals in place, put the right demand signals in place, watch the signal or use the signals that are coming from other parts of the world and just build right as much as is possible. So I think that's to Webhub's comments, to Rahul's comments on alternative to net zero, I think there is no alternative but to think about the alternative about the carbon space. Uh, a net zero concentrates our mind in one way, but we do have to look at the area under the curve. Uh, and frankly, that's right. It's rich countries, but not only rich countries, but it's rich people like ourselves on this call. Right? We have to be the ones making the most sacrifices. And frankly, those sacrifices won't be large. Right? If the impact on a car of green, a green car, green glass, green aluminum, green battery, green uh, steel, the cost of a green car is 10% or 15% more, really, right? If you count for it and if you take some technological advancements uh, in place, right? it's not that much more. Of course, the richer one people use cars, but for, for a poor person for whom the house is the full structure, there isn't that much finishing and so on, you're probably talking about a 40% more expensive house. Right, or 30% more expensive food, which is a large part of their consumption basket. So I think this also kind of goes back to Indu, your point, to say that there are going to be winners and losers, and the poor are going to be the bigger losers. So we have to 
put mechanisms in place and use mechanisms that are already in place to be able to transfer or take away the inflationary effects from the poor. The DBT is an extraordinary mechanism that's already in place in many sectors, can be extended to other sectors, so that the impact on the poor is much less even as we and the rich nations pay for some of this. Um, but I think at the same time, I might say that, you know, while we can say developed countries will pay, we have to worry about our own nation. And, you know, whatever we might say about FDI and funds coming from elsewhere, in the end, it's 10, 15% of the total investment we will make as a nation. So really, we have to be self-reliant and we have to do right for our country and, 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 and really expect to do things in the right way for our country. So look, we should just be up nirmar on this also as much as we can, and we should make as much noise as, as we can to make sure the, 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 the unevenness of this is recognized and the fact that this is not a problem we have created, except more recently, perhaps. Uh, to the jobs argument that several of you have made, I disagree. Uh, I fully agree with the human dimensions of this and the specific issues, right? So me, when I have to repurpose myself from a digital operations person to think about sustainability back again, after 10, 12 years of having left that topic behind, I have a lot of reskilling to do myself. Right? And it's not an easy journey. For each individual that's impacted, it's not an easy journey. But if you take a macro view of it, there are so many bigger issues around the jobs, the job creation itself, right? We 100, 200 million people coming into the workforce, uh, the digitization, which will impact 50 million jobs in India. The fact that we have to pull 100 million people off our farms. I think there are much, much bigger fish to fry or forces to worry about on the jobs front. So that's just a quick response on some of the topics that we, uh, that you all raised. But all in all, thank you very much. I think all pertinent topics, all important topics, all areas that we have to think about and you know, come up with a national view of this. Thank you. Thank you, Rajat. Uh, I think you make some very important points there, you know, particularly, uh, I think it's generally recognized that managing the energy transition is going to require which what many people call a whole of the economy approach. It's not a partial equilibrium. You take one little sector and change something. You're really changing across the board, virtually in all sectors. And, and your presentation brings that out and outlines the various areas where changes are possible. And of course, you know, you, I mean, the way it actually plays out over time, uh, there is uncertainty, we'll know more about it later, but I certainly agree that uh, since we, we have ourselves said we intend to do something, we're no longer in the world of saying that we cannot reduce emissions uh, because that will compromise development. And the main reason we've got out of that is the belief today that you have energy sources that don't generate emissions. So the question is how fast can you transit and as uh, has been pointed out, uh, I also don't agree that 2050 as a universal end date is actually is not correct. Because if you look at it, it's highly inequitable. And if you had any sense of equity in terms of area under the curve, you would come to the conclusion that the starting point of net zero for 2050, which the advanced countries are pushing on, is actually too loose for them. They ought to be moved much earlier to 2040 or something. Also China. And quite honestly, if we adopt that approach, India too may need to move earlier uh, to net zero earlier than 2070. And I think if people are willing to have the advanced countries move by 2040, we should certainly be willing uh, to adjust. And as a matter of fact, their adjustment will solve a lot of the technology problems that will make it easier for us uh, to adjust. Now, I, I took a note of some of the questions that have come up and they're all kind of varied, but one I think is a particularly important, which many people will be thinking about. So let me pose that to you. One of the questions is that you mentioned that net zero cost for India would be 11% of GDP. Uh, whereas for the rest of the world, the average is 7.5. And also because of uh, front loading, for the rest of the world, it's higher initially and then falls and average is 7.5. So the question was, what do those numbers look like for India? Now, having said that, you know, to think that we can actually dish out 
11% of GDP. I mean, is that credible? Uh, how would you respond to that? Thank you. Remember, Thank you. this is this is if eleven percent is viewed as additional. I mean, obviously, if all you're doing is uh, restructuring uh, something that we're doing one way and now have to do it differently, that's not additional. So, what is this eleven percent? Yeah. No. So let me first clarify um, that uh, the eleven percent number is not additional. Uh, about half of that number is already today being spent. Okay. Uh, and uh, so this is relative to today's baseline. And uh, I don't have the number here, but there is some additionality uh, to this relative to the current policy scenario, uh, NGFS current policy, policy scenario. I don't have the number here, uh, but it's certainly half of it is being spent today. Let's just take that as a, as a starting point. Again, I don't have the numbers on the steepness of the curve, the increase that will have to happen initially, initially and then reduced as a percentage of GDP. But if I had, if, if you put a gun to my head and asked me for a view, if we were to head towards the 2050 number, then that number will have to be steeper than for the rest of the world or for the average for the world, mm -hmm. because we are also in a growth mode. Mm -hmm. And we are putting capacities for power, for steel, for cement, for many of these sectors in today. And many of the technologies for this are present, but not at the full potential cost or the lowest potential cost yet because these technologies, hydrogen-based steel making as an example, CCUS for carbon dioxide, many of these technologies are somewhat further away from adoption in some cases, some because of physical barriers. For example, we haven't explored for uh, storage uh, opportunities in India uh, that, may, that may exist, um, carbon storage opportunities. So I might say, I might venture to say that it's probably the curve itself is steeper in its rise for India. If we were to stick to that, 2050 number, which is also one of the reasons, and I fully agree with you that this target has to be, if to meet the global target of 2050, the global, uh, other nations, <coughs> developed nations, possibly China, have to advance it and leave a little bit of room for countries like India. And yep. as we move forward, India may surprise itself. It has surprised itself relative to its Paris uh, commitments also. Well, you know, surprising yourself relative to Paris commitments, I don't think counts for very much because those were, I mean, the wonder was that there were commitments. They were quite ridiculously loose. Uh, if we surprise ourselves with the Glasgow commitments, that would be a very, very major achievement. I mean, currently we are running behind and getting to those targets is going to be a bit of a strain, but that's that's fine. Uh, one, uh, one question that uh, comes up in this context, uh, and that is that somebody raised this issue that, you know, uh, I think you mentioned and uh, others mentioned the fact that the difference, there's unevenness of impact. And um, I think it was uh, Swati, I think, who talked about the uh, interstate differences, um, you know, where coal is being produced and iron and steel and so on. Now, you know, somebody has raised the question that uh, are there lessons from other federations and how do you get states on board? Do you have something you want to comment on? And how have others managed it? Because everybody's got regional differences. We're not the only ones with regional differences. So how do we do it? Maybe I, we should open this up a little bit wider. I didn't fully understand the questions by state federations. No, the question was industry, that- industry uh, Is this industry federations? That we are talking about, or is it? No, 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 no. Federal structures. I federal mean, structure. a basic proposition that if India makes the transition, uh, it's going to impact different states differently. I mean, all the coal unemployment, or the, rather the loss of employment, will be concentrated in the central eastern states. The new employment in the solar plants will be in other states. That employment may actually be better quality. But the states that lose employment will have worries and there's coal royalty and so on. So I think the question was, in the specific area of climate change, are you aware from your studies or from McKinsey Institute, how have other federal structures managed to overcome this problem? I mean, look, I think the, the idea that comes to my mind is why don't we have our own COP26 as a nation? Right, with a set of directions which are top down. And then at the same time, states come up with their own nationally or whatever state determined aspirations. We saw the city of Bombay come up with something, Mumbai, right? 
uh, recently, but we haven't seen too many states move on this, right? So if we can have a dialogue of this nature, and you know, yeah, as things start adding up. Yeah, that is right? That's a starting point for something like this. Others may have a view on this. A related issue that came up, uh, it hasn't been posed very specifically by any of the, in the chat box, but it was clear from what you said. You mentioned at one time that it's not just a problem of rich countries. There are rich people in India, as you said, you and me, uh, we have a very high uh, uh, consu consumption pattern that is very intensive in emissions. You know, obviously the, the best way of handling that is carbon pricing. But I find there is no willingness on the part of almost any of the people who are concerned about this issue to support carbon pricing. In fact, the proposition that we should have carbon pricing is very often viewed as some kind of a foreign implant. And yet, you know, if you look at what's happening, and we are very reliant on petroleum and petroleum products to generate revenues. We are hoping to phase these things out with growing electrification of vehicles and electric buses and train and even railway traction. We need to substitute something for this loss of revenues. And the best substitution really would be uh, through some form of carbon pricing, which would actually put a huge burden on coal. That would, of course, raise the cost of coal-based electricity. It would make renewables a lot more competitive and it will generate revenues as the transition takes place. But I bet you if you, if you at your next lecture in a university, if you say this, uh, you will not receive any support on the grounds that this hurts the poor. So what is your, how do you react to that? Uh, my, my, my own reaction is that I think it's inevitable for us to have some more form of carbon pricing, even in a country like Indonesia has put something in place, $5, dollars, very small. It needs to be different. So right? we, so, we did that too, by the way, very small. You yeah, see, I think just as the Paris commitments, let us ignore what are de minimis moves in the right direction. I mean, we put a 400 rupees or something per ton of coal, whereas actually we needed about 3,000. Yeah. You know, no, so, so I think the I think the putting the mechanisms for carbon markets in place based on perhaps the PAT schemes that have already have been implemented, we can build on those. I think is an imperative. And at the same time, as inflation hits for energy-based uh, products, to be able to then compensate the real poor, right? Which we have the mechanisms for um, through the direct benefit transfers and so on. I think this has to be uh, the path forward. And in my view, again, as we think about the 2070 bookend, albeit it's 50 years from now, but as we think about the bookend and as the debates, the initiatives that have to be put in place, this is, has to be a major initiative. I think it helps us as a nation. So, I mean, I, again, I come at it from a perspective of some, of some of the companies that I converse with. They're companies who are very far thinking uh, and have basically put very aspirational targets for 2025 and for 2030. When you go inside them, they're going to lose money to meet those targets. But if there was a carbon, and there, these are all things in the right direction, it'll reduce imported energy, imported energy uh, it'll reduce pollution, uh, it'll reduce carbon emissions, uh, all sensible things to do. But they will have to spend money. Their shareholders may not allow them to do that. Right? Now, if a carbon price was in place, some of these actions would become economic. Oh, sure, absolutely. Right, and so the action would move. So I absolutely agree with you. You see, the, uh, a short while ago, the IMF staff produced a staff paper in which they suggested a form of carbon pricing which was progressive, depending on the level of development of the country. I mean, they said that, look, India should put in place a carbon pricing which is $25 per ton, China should put in place $50 per ton, and the advanced countries should put in place $75 per ton. Now, personally, we should readily agree with this. And actually, we should agree to do it, assuming that the West does it. And my guess is that they won't. So we won't even have to implement it in the short run. But I think we need to recognize that some of this is necessary. Otherwise, we're just shooting in the dark. Fully agree. Well, um, now there was one other thing. Yeah, somebody raised the question. Uh, it said that in this very useful paper, 
There's no discussion on investment in health infrastructure as a way of tackling climate change. Uh, you want to respond to that? I don't understand. I mean, of course, these are linked, right? So if there are climate refugees, health is going to, I mean, health is going to be a problem, for example, heat uh, and the consequent impact on health. But I see these as more secondary. I don't see the direct link because health to me is in the 69% of the world's GDP. This is where climate, they don't have that much role to play, at least directly. The role has to be played by the energy producers, the energy converters, uh, the energy, the, the carbon buying, product buying. Uh, and so, so, so to, the, to the extent that hospitals need to be built greener with less cement, or to the extent that pharmaceutical companies want to push, should push to buy greener chemicals. Yes, but it's not, to me, it's not that tightly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I, my suspicion is that what they had in mind was that climate change is going to promote uh, more kind of zoonotic transmission of diseases, et cetera. So maybe for adaptation, it yes. increases the need to do a lot more on health, all of which adds to that 11% or even half of 11% that you talked about. It's quite a formidable bill, uh, you know, and the problem really is we have lots of other such bills independent of climate change. So adding it all up is quite difficult. I think we've reached the time limit that was given, but I Can do I make one more comment? Uh... Yes, please. Montek. So look, I think there was this question of MSME and large enterprises. Uh, that yes. also came up. Uh, if I might assert, and for somebody to really investigate, that I think this is a large company problem, it's not an MSME problem. Why do I say that? 40% uh, of our emissions or thereabouts are power. That's a large company issue. Uh, and of course, you know, solutions may be small company, rooftop, solar, etc. But the the, the, where the emissions are being generated are in coal-based power plants. Yes, of course, MSMEs may have captive power plants or maybe using diesel generation, but diesel-based generation where they're short of power, but it's, if the large companies are able to supply enough power, if the grid is able to handle things, I think we, MSMEs don't have to worry that much. 25% of our emissions are in steel cement refining or thereabouts, right? Large companies, these are not small companies. Uh, there is a proportion of small companies also, but you know, 80% of the production, more and more, unlike in the 1990s, early 90s, or before in the 80s, comes from large companies. 10% is in transportation. Again, the producers of the transportation equipment are large companies. So I might assert that this is adding up to, what is it, 75% of the emissions. There's agriculture, 8%, water, um, waste, about 8% or thereabouts, right? So there are others which are more distributed. But to me, this, I might, I'm just asserting this, it's a large company problem, uh, or it can, it's a large company problem and solution, and less so an MSME solution, and that, that may be a red herring. I thought actually the, the, the import of that question was that the MSMEs will become uh, the recipients of some of the burdens associated with the transition. I mean, the most obvious case, for example, is that if you go from internal combustion engines to electric engines, then the number of components in an electric engine is a minuscule, whereas we've got a huge components industry of MSMEs. So as a matter of fact, what we're really saying, telling them is that, look, if we don't want any more uh, ICR, ICE vehicles sold after let's say 2030 or 2035, which is quite reasonable, if you want to make an adjustment, then I think you don't have a business after 2035. Maybe some in batteries and, you know, rehabilitating batteries, et cetera. But otherwise, a very large number of the automotive components industry will just disappear. Now, you know, the fact is when we are making a transition, I mean, lots of businesses are going to disappear. And I think it's a mistake to think that we can plan for all this in advance to say, well, this is what's going to be the impact on this business and that business and the other business, and this is what we're going to. I mean, I think politics will take care of that as it evolves. That would be my answer. But but the real concern was, as we transit, will we somehow phase out MSMEs? My guess is we will. Uh, and, yeah, and by the way, new new ones will come up, right? Because the investment yes. magnitude is so yes. large. The construction, for example, the capex deployment, huge opportunity. Right, components, yep. yes, fewer components for for uh, 
battery recycling. There, there are opportunities for small businesses. And look, we've been through these transitions. The economic reform which you led, uh, Montek, right, has led to amazing amount of trans transition in our economy in, in, in the physical production. And you know, I, I think that's what is going to happen. And it's all ha going to happen for the right. No, I agree with you. And I think we underestimate a, a system's ability to respond when it's shaken up. But of course, the concern you said that if you're really concerned about the poor, then creating a direct benefit type social safety net directed at the really vulnerable, that's really the way to go. Well, anyway, thank you very much. Unless there anybody else, Rakesh, do you want to pitch in with a question? Uh, we are kind of towards the end, but always room for you. No, I I won't pitch in with a question, but I can conclude the proceedings. <laughs> Allow me to invite you to conclude the proceedings, <laughs> but you can sneak in an observation in the middle of it if you like. Yeah, that I will do. So uh, first, uh, first, all the thank yous. That is first, of course, to Rajat Gupta from uh, McKinsey. And I do have to make a disclosure, which is that I am a senior advisor to McKinsey Global Institute. Uh, so uh, that's why I have sort of limited my participation in this in terms of conflict of interest. Uh, however, thank you so much, Rajat, for that very thoughtful presentation, when we say so. Uh, of course, uh, in, as in usual McKinsey style, the charts are too complex for anyone to absorb. So uh, what we would appreciate very much is if you can send us that uh, presentation, which we can put on our website so that it's available to uh, everyone. Um, the uh, one other thing I'm very happy about actually is that we had representatives, uh, Vaibhav Chaturvedi from CEW, uh, Swati D'Souza from the IEA, uh, Indu Murthy from C-STEP, and of course, our own very own Rahul Tongya. I was about to say KL Rahul, but I guess he's not a cricketer yet. Uh, uh, Rahul Tongya uh, from CSEP. I'm very happy because you know, the, the whole climate change issue is so complex and um, so full of difficulties, both in thinking, science, and of course, in implementation of uh, measures that uh, I think that uh, it's, it's, it's terrific that each of our institutions is doing this work and maybe we can communicate more with each other so that we don't duplicate uh, work within ourselves. A uh, couple few, few, uh, a few uh, substantive comments. One, just to say that at CSEP, uh, we are working a lot as Rahul is leading on energy transition, the impacts on different aspects of uh, energy like regulation, uh, pricing and everything else. Second, one thing that wasn't mentioned, although it was mentioned passing, is the fiscal impact that as you reduce the uh, importance of uh, fossil fuels, the amount of revenue that the government is getting from different fossil fuels, uh, petrol, diesel, um, coal for that matter, and others, uh, there is going to be a very significant fiscal impact. And we've already done some work on that. Third, one thing that was mentioned, Rajat, uh, is the financing of climate change. Now, I can say both some negative as well as positive things. One, the 6% of GDP incremental on a regular basis for at least 20 years, if not longer, is huge, absolutely huge. And in this context, I may mention that some of us who have been working on infrastructure investment since the mid-1990s, uh, we had kind of come up with a number that really ought to be investing around 8% of GDP in infrastructure, all told. And we have had difficulty in really going beyond 5-6% uh, at the best of times in the last uh, 25 years. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is really a very, very big ask. And there are real issues to do with this. Um, and also you know, where the financing will come from, how much public, how much private, how much through taxes, carbon taxes for that matter, how much international. There are some macro issues also associated with how much any, any country in India can absorb from uh, international uh, transfers or investment, which is where you look. I mean, so for example, one of the uh, things that came out uh, last couple of days in, uh, at the end of the fiscal year is that now the servicing of previous foreign FDI, that is dividends and, uh, and so on, is now catching up with net FDI investment coming into the country. And so these things pile up that if you have a lot of foreign, foreign investment, whether it's in debt or in equity, you then start to have to pay it at some point. It's not free. Um, so I think those are very important issues, which, which many of us will have to uh, work with. 
On the SMEs and employment, uh, I think one issue that I've often talked about is that, that we in India, I think, have kind of gone wrong in thinking that SMEs generate employment and large industries don't. Um, and, if the, the, and the our policies have in some sense done that so that it is correct that large industries do have low employment. But if you just compare with China, that if we have, I mean, we have not had more than 12, 12 13, 14 million people employed in uh, large scale manufacturing. China had 100 million at its peak. Of course, I assume that it's come down, it's actually about 120 million as I speak. I assume that it's come down now. So I think that's an issue also that is of interest that look, if we have the right policies, will large industries, particularly the labor intensive type, actually in fact, uh, generate more employment than, than, than SMEs. Um, so that's really what, uh, just on the positive side of the investment. Now, one thing that has happened is that at the peak in the late 2000s, that is 2007, eight or thereabouts, uh, total investment, uh, gross domestic capital formation in the country had indeed gone up to 38%. It's now down to, I think, 32, 33, or something like that. I forgot the current number. So on, on I said on the positive side, we've done it before. And uh, it seems to me that again, if you have the right policy, it's feasible. I think it's worth looking at some of these macro uh, numbers which others have also talked about. So uh, finally, it, um, it just uh, remains for me to thank our staff and the communications team, uh, Trishna, uh, Monica, and Malvika. Uh, thank you so much for all the background work. We don't even see your faces, but uh, no, with these things wouldn't happen without all the work that you do. Thank you very much. And thank you so much. I guess I have not thanked you, Montek. So I should thank you as our own very distinguished fellow. Um, <laughs> and what we are lucky with, which I hadn't associated with him when, he, when, he, when we got him last, early last year, was that he would do as, take as much interest in climate change as he is. And so he's really, really leading us in that sense along with Rahul. Thank you, Montek, for doing this. Thanks, Rahul.